It's time for yours truly, Jimmy Powers, with another Grantland Rice story. Hi there, this is Jimmy Powers transcribed with another chapter from the Grantland Rice story, The Tumult and the Shouting. And so with a sharp salute to the ever young spirit of Grantland Rice, I take up the narrative in first person. While I've spent much of my life heaping laurels on the winner, I have a strong feeling for the loser, particularly the unbreakables. These are the worth of the world, the pride of the race. These who have taken their blastings, blown from the track. These who have faltered and fallen, wrecked by the pace. These who have come to their feet and dared to storm back. Yes, as I've said before, I'll always feel at home in the valleys. I'd rather look up to some peak than be on the peak looking down on those who need help. And for these special friends of mine, these uncrowned champions, I respected them, blown and battered, attempting to scale those peaks and knocked into the depths they didn't know, in fact, never knew how to quit. These then are some of my uncrowned champions. Some were famous and some weren't so well known, but they fit in this category. Let's look at these athletes a little closer. In many respects, Lou Gehrig, the iron horse of the great Yankee teams, was an uncrowned champ. Had he been claimed by any other team, Gehrig would have ridden a solid gold pedestal. However, the Yankee first baseman, yes, he's my all-time best in this position, played the majority of his years in the shadow of Babe Ruth. When Babe went into decline, Lou, who had been around for so long he was taken for granted, like the wonderful one-horse Shea. The Yankees were seeking fresh idol material when they came up with a young Italian, a fisherman's boy from San Francisco. Joe DiMaggio. Gehrig spanned from the greatest years of Ruth into the early spotlight years of DiMaggio, playing out his string of 2,130 consecutive games. What was Lou's lifetime batting average? Only 340. But there will always be something about the panther-like grace of a DiMaggio that will thrill me to the marrow, and in keeping with that, here's my pen sketch of Joe. No greater effort than a breeze that blows across the field when some fly ball is struck a drifting phantom where the long smash goes that has no helping teammate known as luck. No desperate stab, no wild one-handed catch, few ringing cheers that churn the summer air. A shift, a turn, a movement none can match, the ball drifts down, DiMaggio is there. A swing, a slash, the ball is on, the whipping ash still keeps the foe at bay, a blur against the blue, and then the ball is gone. Ty Cobb has ruled, and Ruth has sung his tune. Tris Speaker was a melody in rhyme. DiMaggio, you won't forget him soon. Here is the master artist of our time. One day around 1930, I was beside Babe in the Yankee dugout watching Gehrig take batting practice. He was line driving that ball deep into the right field bleachers. Babe, I said, how does Lou shape up to you? Babe reflected a moment. Grant, he said, if I had to pitch against that big Dutch Sandow, I'd wear a suit of armor. You know, pitchers don't especially relish throwing against me. I bang that ball pretty good. But the majority of times, I lift the ball. 
Lou, line drives it. This boy has an overdrive of everything. You know, I think he kind of worships me, rumbled Babe. I'm considered colorful. This boy, Gehrig, wouldn't know color if he fell in it. He thinks and lives team. Grant, if I ever become manager of this or any club, I'd have to go for the team guy. That's what I think of Gehrig. A whisper comes from the palms and pines where the lazy south wind blows, where the pelican dives for his meal again, wherever the gulf tide flows. And this is the message I seem to get from years that belong to youth. Where are Gehrig and Dickey now? What has become of Ruth? Where is the crash we remember still over the outfield wall? Where is the smash and cannonade as the bat lashed into the ball? Where is the noise that we used to hear? Slip me the chilling truth. Where are Gehrig and Dickey now? What has become of Ruth? Gehrig brings to mind another uncrowned champ. Of course, Columbia Lou is enshrined in baseball's Hall of Fame, practically one of its keystones. But this next fellow hasn't made it, and I doubt he ever will. His name? Jake Daubert, one of the slickest chips down first baseman ever to wear a glove. Over in Brooklyn, old-timers can recite facts and figures to prove just how good Daubert was, but not too many other fans remember him as more than just another name. Yet, a fellow named Casey Stengel played with Daubert. Better than a green hand at sizing up the wheat from the chaff, Casey rubbed his chin and meditated long when I asked him how he rated Jake. I've seen some good ones since I broke into the big time, about the time Grover Cleveland was shot, said Casey this particular night, over a julep, at the Sorino Hotel in St. Petersburg. But Jake Dobert was perhaps the brainiest, niftiest fielding first baseman I ever knew. From 1910 through 1918, Dobert was the fielding and clutch hitting marvel for the Brooks, including their first pennant year, 1916. He clouded over 300 for seven of nine years, then played out his span through 1924 with Cincinnati, where he died suddenly at the age of 39. He may never get it, but Jake belongs in Cooperstown. Golf has its share of champions, but I can't think of any golfer who wears the mantle of uncrowned champ with more grace than Sam Sneed. Sam has picked up enough gold in pressure shooting to start an annex for Fort Knox where they store the stuff. But Sneed has yet to win the big one, the National Open. A large measure of luck rides with any putt over 10 feet on undulating greens. I don't care how true the putting surface happens to be. That's why Lady Luck still owes something to Sam in the biggest pot hunt of all, the Open. At this late stage of his competitive career, I'm not at all sure she ever will. It's like this, always will be. Dame Fortune is a cockeyed wench, as someone said before. And yet the old dame plays her part in any winning score. Take all the credit you deserve, heads up in winning pride. But don't forget that Lady Luck was riding at your side. The sweetest natural swinger of them all, Sneed has collected the sourest apples in this particular tournament. And then there's a wonderful girl named Helen Jacobs, which brings up the question, can the gals take it when the going is roughest? Usually. However, undefeated in six years, Helen Wills had always walloped Helen Jacobs when the chips were down came the 1933 tennis championships at Forest Hills when Queen Helen again faced Miss Jacobs in the final. Surprisingly, Miss Wills dropped the first set, but when she won the second, the tennis writers were about to drag out the same old adjectives for the same old story. Then, suddenly and dramatically, Miss Wills's game fell apart. With the score three love against her, Helen Wills suddenly turned to the umpire, announced she could continue no longer, and marched to the showers. On that particular afternoon, on the center court turf of the stadium, it was champion by default, Helen Jacobs. In her hour of triumph, achieved only after years of the most grueling uphill going, Helen Jacobs earned my little laurel of uncrowned champ. The boxing ring has its share of uncrowned champs. Middleweight Harry Greb, pound for pound, perhaps the greatest ever, has been a headliner for more than 10 years, was well along the downgrade when he finally got a shot at the crown. Greb, who fought 42 bouts in one year, 1919, finally met Johnny Wilson for the middleweight crown in 1923. Yes, Greb won it. In between, he fought anything and anybody from heavyweights on down. 
acknowledged a vicious spoiler, even Dempsey wanted no part of Grib. Then there was Jeff Smith, another middleweight, who never did get a crack at the crown. Some 200 of Jeff's fights are in the record book, but he fought nearly 600 bouts all over the world, accepting any and all fights and decisions. Jeff Smith's only shot at champions were when they had become ex-champs. I also recall a natural featherweight named Johnny Dundee, who fought from 1910 through 1929, 19 years. Dundee battled Johnny Kilbane to a draw in 1913, but Kilbane never gave Dundee another shot at the title. In fact, it wasn't until the Frenchman, Eugene Creakey, KO'd Kilbane in 1923 that Dundee was given his chance. Less than two months later, Dundee, a 10-year man in a five-year business, defeated Creakey in 15 rounds. Packy McFarland, Sam Langford, and Mike Gibbons were other headbusters that few top-notchers would fight. They made the rounds for years, fighting anyone they could get, but none of these was given his rightful day in court until he was all but washed up. Keep coming back, although the world may romp across your spine. Let every game's end find you still upon the battling line. For when the one great scorer comes to mark against your name, he writes, not that you won or lost, but how you played the game. Now this is Jimmy Powers transcribed saying so long until next time.